Greetings to all of you today and welcome to our webcast on telemedicine and its role in improving patient safety. I want to welcome our guest speakers for today, Dr. Ronald Weinstein and Dr. Jeff Dunn, who will discuss the evolution of telemedicine and its recent developments, uh, especially regarding its very promising role in improving patient safety and particularly in the context of what's going on today with the current pandemic crisis. So let me introduce our speakers and we'll dive right into the conversation. Ronald Weinstein, MD, is the director of the national award-winning Arizona Telemedicine Program, which he founded in 1996. Dr. Weinstein is a Mass General Hospital trained pathologist and in fact, he was the chairman of pathology at the University of Arizona when I came there in 1995. Historically, he was the first resident physician to sign out a telemedicine case at the MGH way back in 1968, about a, about a half century ago. He went on to invent, patent, and commercialize telepathology, which today is a billion dollar industry. Dr. Weinstein has served as president of six professional organizations, including the American Telemedicine Association, where he is president emeritus. He is universally recognized as a pioneer in the field of telemedicine. Dr. Jeff Dunn, DO, is a physician entrepreneur who is currently working as a telehospitalist for St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City where he is providing inpatient care via telemedicine. He is a champion of patient safety and quality as it is enabled by innovation and technology. Jeff founded Redivus Health in 2015, which is a medical software company that provides augmented intelligence for time critical events such as cardiac arrest and sepsis. So with those introductions, let us begin with our first question. I'll ask uh, Ron Weinstein, to foresee our future, we must always understand our past. You've all heard the famous quote on that. Those who cannot learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Can you give us a brief overview of the history of telemedicine, its original mission and strategies, and how those have developed over the years, Ron? Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Steve, for the uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, certainly safety is an issue that would be foremost in every pathologist's mind because when we do autopsies is to find out what the patient had but also what went wrong. Uh, telemedicine uh, really dates back in the United States back into the 1960s, and it was an outgrowth of space medicine. And uh, NASA was looking for terrestrial applications of healthcare. And that was very, very important in launching the original programs. Uh, telemedicine really, I would say, went into its current curve uh, around 1995. And in 1995, there were a handful of programs in the country. Uh, most of them were doing either teleradiology or telepsychiatry. There were about 500,000 cases a year. And over the years, there was a pretty steady growth at the rate of 20 to 25% in terms of number of cases. So if you roll forward uh, 25 years, you'll find out that we were up to about 37 million cases by 2019. And uh, 2019 uh, went into 2020 and, and uh, COVID came along and caused what is either going to be defined by history as a surge or a tsunami, big differences there. And uh, we're now estimating that the number of cases for the current year will be about a billion. So we will have gone from 37 million estimate to a billion in a year. There are over a hundred applications of telemedicine being done. Uh, it's been quite heavily commercialized. There now are about 400 companies in the United States providing direct to hospital services which was the first large area of implementation on the back of radiology. And then much more recently, the last five years, direct to consumer, which has really taken off and will probably end up dwarfing what we did in terms of direct to hospital. 
And uh, so that's the, uh, the short part of the uh, growth of telemedicine. Uh, it's become a big area of investment into companies that do telemedicine services. In uh, 2017 alone, about $280 million came out of uh, Silicon Valley investment companies for telemedicine services specifically. And uh, today there are companies on the uh, big stock exchanges that have evaluations of over $12 billion. So it's become a big industry and a big factor in healthcare uh, in the United States. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, to Jeff, do you have anything to add on Ron's history overview and how has your own involvement in telemedicine developed over the last years? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and good to be with you, Ron. Um, just to give you a little a background on myself. So I, I finished my residency in 2006. So really um, started to see the, the wide adoption of the EHR back in 2006. It took me till about 2012 or 13 to experience my first um, telehealth visit. And um, it, there, it wasn't widely adopted then. So um, I remember the equipment was large and cumbersome. And um, really what we've seen in the last 10 years as far as adoption of new technology that's uh, more uh, user-centric, more usability uh, involved in that has really what I've seen in the last three years. Um, so you can use technologies, you see, see things like FaceTime and different uh, lay people apps that have really, I think, uh, made telehealth evolve quite rapidly. So what I've seen is these technologies have got more usable, there's more devices to use, like stethoscopes when you're listening to a patient. And really at the, at the core of telehealth, I believe, is to put your eyes and to be able to listen to a patient at any time in any geography. So I think that the, the patient safety movement has evolved quite rapidly with the help of telehealth. Thanks, Jeff. And with that view of the, of the past and present, what do you see coming in the future for telemedicine that we haven't yet seen? And how has that been affected or will be affected by the COVID pandemic? Well, Oh, go ahead. That's Jeff. Yeah, a couple things that I see. So um, some of the things that I've been using with telehealth are drag and dictation. So the enablement of being able to dictate a note and making that easier for a provider. I really do believe that the devices will end up um, evolving. So doing bedside echoes as you're um, looking and evaluating a patient, I think would be extremely helpful. Um, and, and then I see also the consolidation of the technology. I have about seven apps on my phone that I use at any one time. I use three different EMRs because I cover 19 different hospitals. So I really think that um, these platforms need to get together and, and really combine and, and improve the user experience of the provider. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. Back to you, Ron. What are your additional thoughts on the future of telemedicine, things that we have not yet seen, and how do you think that will impact patient safety? Well, I think there are a couple of things. First of all, telemedicine is actually very underdeveloped. Uh, use of telemedicine in areas like uh, mindfulness and areas like counseling and coaching and marrying uh, telemedicine with health literacy and actually creating uh, cradle to grave portals for people's education where we can have mass customization of what they've learned and updating it so that it's relevant to their lives. All of that's within the capable capability of telemedicine. Uh, but I think that's what's going to be emerging quite quickly is the addition of, of uh, other areas to the doctor's black bag. Uh, robotics certainly is going to expand considerably. Automation, of course, is very present in the pathology world today, but automation is gonna come a long way. And then we have the huge area of AI. And AI is gonna to begin to come into the workforce from the bottom up. It's first gonna be the aides and the, the uh, nurses assistants and so on and so forth, and moving up, up the scale up toward 
the actual healthcare uh, uh, professionals uh, at the doctoral level. And those are gonna be huge areas, but they're also gonna be areas where safety is gonna emerge as a progressively greater and greater factor. You know, they've now shown that an automated car can go 8.1 miles without having some kind of a fatal problem. So as we get into AI, the obstacles are gonna be enormous, but the rewards are gonna be enormous. And that's, that's all for the next decade. All right. Thank you, Ron. That's a great lead in to my next question, which is about obstacles. Uh, Dr. Dunn, what, what do you see as obstacles and challenges for, for achieving these goals in the near future? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, um, I gave up practicing for about five years to run the company Redibus Health, which is a clinical decision support company, and um, came about um, during this pandemic of wanting to help out. And I can tell you that what we've seen from a um, adoption uh, curve of the federal government, CMS adopting um, users like myself that gets a license in Kansas, being able to help out in New York, that has been extremely accelerated. And I think a federal approach to the standardization of telemedicine is really needed. When you start talking about state licensures, you get very siloed. You have 50 different ways to do things. So I, I really see the, the value in creating one standard licensure as far as telemedicine. That way, when you have your next pandemic and you have surges in New York and New Jersey and uh, in Florida, you can have uh, the doctor work, workforce as well as um, some, some of these advanced providers help out and not have to wait to get um, stamped or licensure, et cetera. They can just go help where the surge needs it. So Jeff, uh, as a follow-up to that, how can telemedicine organizations and the patient safety movement work together to overcome these types of challenges? No, I, I, I think that um, it's definitely, uh, they're in parallel universes, uh, the patient safety movement, as well as telehealth. If you can imagine um, being a second year resident in the VA, taking care of a patient and not having access to a uh, potentially an attending back like we had it in the day, you never have a time when you can't get help. So having the ability to have your phone at the very least, be able to have somebody that knows more than you about something, be able to pour it in and help you. I think that's what patient safety is all about. So you never feel like you don't have that security blanket there. And I really believe that both of these swim lanes are, are very much supporting of each other. I, I fully agree. And I really look forward to seeing these, these different parts of organized medicine working more closely together. Ron, what, uh, what are your concluding thoughts on this? How can organized telemedicine, which you have been such a key part of, work together with patient safety and in particular with the patient safety movement, which uh, we are rec representing here today. What are our first steps in, in establishing that collaboration? All right. Now, first of all, I want to thank Jeff. I think the points that he are ma he's making are pure gold. So he articulates that so well. You know, I think, I think that there's a moment in time right now that's very important. And uh, I have to I hope the safety movement jumps in. We're trying, we are trying to get the telemedicine movement in, but none of us, none of us, uh, including last year's medical school graduates, none of us took a rotation in telemedicine or had instruction in medical school because medical schools resisted doing that really until now. And uh, we've tried for years to get it into the curriculum and uh, try to work with the AAMC and they're pretty much, they gave us awards, but then turned a deaf ear. So uh, we're at the point right now, I'm sitting on a, a committee that's a program committee for a virtual symposium on telemedicine being sponsored by the AAMC and the Mass General, and it's going to be in September. And I'm trying very hard to get safety in it. It's mainly on what should be the core competencies for telemedicine. And when I bring up, well, we really should be talking interprofessional education, that's been a long time commitment of mine as well. Oh, yeah, we don't want to talk about that. It's just not, this, this is not about nurses. Really? Uh, well, how about safety? Oh, no, no, we just, just want to talk about telemedicine. 
We have to succeed in that because this is the point at which the template for the next 10 years for medical education to meet core competency is going to take place. And we really, and I am on the committee, can't, we have to be campaigning to say that is part of the discussion, but that's a co-equal in the discussion. And we're going to try to push that forward, but be aware that this is the moment in time, kind of very much like the Flexner report in its own way. This is the point at which curriculum will be defined for the next uh, 25 years. And the window of opportunity is barely open, but we have to bear down and get involved and be visible. Now, uh, the other thing I would say, based on, you know, long, long experience in organized medicine, we have to be writing editorials, we have to be writing op-ed paces, we have to get out of our own journals and really talk about how do we get into JAM and the, the Journal of Medicine and the, those journals in order to be visible. This is really the moment to, to move forward. And I would certainly look forward to uh, moving ahead with the two of you, uh, specifically on those specific projects. Thank you, Ron. That was extremely well said. In fact, I would add, uh, as, as you said, we need to start teaching telemedicine in medical school. We also need to start doing a lot more teaching of patient safety in medical school and reducing medical errors. Uh, I, I remember that was not even discussed back when I was in medical school. I think there's a a little bit going on now, but it has a ways to go. Dr. Dunn, what are your concluding thoughts? Is this a useful conversation? And what do you see as the next steps in, in developing this collaboration? I really, it, this has been a wonderful conversation. And it, it uh, makes me want to have several more conversations on it, to be perfectly honest. Um, I really do um, agree with Ron that this needs to be part of the medical education I really see that um, medical simulation is one of those big tidal waves. The, the whole saying of see one, do one, teach one, you don't have to practice on people anymore. You can practice on a mannequin. So I think that that's a perfect place to be able to employ these technologies and practice on them is while you're doing medical simulation, learn how to do telehealth too. So I do think that this is a huge part of medical uh, education as we go into the future. You learn how to do, you know, learning how to have a tough conversation with the family, learning how to use the telehealth technologies, doing medical simulation to practice. This is really what uh, the patient safety movement is all about, in my opinion. Well said, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up simulation because uh, that, that tickles me. As you might know, my previous life was aeronautical engineering. And I think there are a lot of lessons from aviation that can be brought into patient safety and telemedicine as well. Simulation is just one of those. Um, this has, uh, has really stimulated me. I want to thank you both for your participation in this patient safety movement webcast. I think it has been wonderful. I think it has been a very stimulating discussion and I really hope it will be the beginning of a long-term collaboration between organized telemedicine and the patient safety movement. I want to thank all of you in the audience for your, for your attendance and participation. And please email us any questions you have. You can send those emails to clinical, C-L-I-N-I-C-A-L, -I -I at patientsafetymovement.org, O-R-G. That is the email address to send your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you very much and have a great day.